Um, good afternoon, everybody. I am really, really pleased to be here, but I have to say I was a little bit daunted being asked to speak at a learning and teaching conference when I haven't taught for, what, 15 years or so. So I am way out of date. I've, yeah, John Leach's mouth, chin. I've done bits of teaching, but um, I've been doing administration and management for a long time now. But it's still the teaching that does make me passionate about my job. It transforms lives, learning transforms lives. And Graham just mentioned um, the Inspirational Teachers Award, and I just wanted to share a quote with you. I'm really fortunate. When people receive their awards, I get all these lovely messages saying thank you. It's nothing to do with me, it's all to do with you. But I thought this, this quote was great. The reward of teaching is the fact that I come to work excited and not full of dread. Our students never cease to amaze me, and it is their inspiration which makes something can't read without my specs on. <laughs> anyway, you get the sense of it, you get the drift. The other part of why I was worried about speaking was, was Graham asked me to speak about myself, and this is the second time in a week I've been asked to speak about myself in different sort of setups. Um, so what I thought I would do is tell you something about my journey through learning and teaching, and it does go back to coming up to 30 years in higher education now, but I started as a school teacher. Um, and I taught PE and maths. My discipline in universities when I got into university life was physiology. So just to give you a bit of an understanding where I've come from. So I'm hoping that what you'll get from this is some of the underlying principles that I believe never change in terms of teaching. If this works, did earlier. So where did it all begin? The very first presentation I ever gave at a conference was about group work. And I can remember thinking when I was working with students on group work, I saw group work done really poorly. Students given an assessment, all given the same mark, never really talked about the dynamics of a group and what they were bringing as individuals. And it wasn't used in a real learning sense in terms of how to work in groups. I wanted to think about how to use self-assessment, peer assessment, get students to think about the role they played, others played, their contribution, how you would assess that, develop the assessment criteria. And I went through a big process of trying different things out with the students and then eventually presented it at a conference. So that's my earliest memory really of thinking, how am I going to engage students in this activity and make it meaningful rather than just doing group work because somebody says it's a good thing to do. The next one fits nicely hang on, with Simon this morning. Lectures. I told you I taught physiology. We will all have had a bad experience in the classroom. My worst, and actually it was a guest lecture, I'd been asked to go and do a session about the kidney. And the technology let me down. It didn't work. And for those of you that know your anatomy, it is a very complex organ. And I was waving my arms around, trying to show what a kidney looked like and talk about it. And I really just should have sent everybody away straight away. It was a disaster, an absolute total disaster. But also I found that so many of the concepts that I was talking about in my lectures were just not reaching the students. It was very difficult to get the depth of understanding that they needed and to get that exchange. What I did used to do, as Simon said, and I'm now breaking the rules today in my quick 20 minutes, is try to make sure I broke up the lecture with bits of activity and try to do some practical bits or exchange of ideas. Um, so I, I moved away from them. I did, still did lectures, but not many. And I went towards what now we'd call scale up, but we'd never heard of it then. And I took my big group, because physiology could have up to 400, I would take them into a classroom, big round tables, set them workbooks, set them scenarios. If I couldn't fit them all in, rotate them in and out. The group I was sending out would have activities to do out of the classroom. So it was about how can we work differently and how can I better engage students with their learning. So that was quite early on. And I do remember going to my head of department and saying, I think I'm going to stop doing lectures. And it was, oh, you can't. And I had to carry on doing them. But in those days, the technology wasn't as it is now, and I couldn't put it all up there. Activity, engaging students with learning. 
One of the things, I wouldn't be allowed to do this now for health and safety, but I used to send my students running up and down the tower block, up and down the stairs, to get them thinking about how it affected heart, heart rate and respiration. So you couldn't do it. You maybe can't see, but that golfer is blindfold. And when I was teaching motor skills, which isn't about cars, but about how the um, body coordinates movement, I wanted to talk about how the different senses could be dominant. And so I actually did take the students into a sports hall and blindfold them and taught them to hit a golf ball so that they became more aware of other senses and recognised how dominant sight was in this particular skill. So I was always trying to think of little activities that could get over quite complex messages. Um, I did have one very bad experience of blindfold activity as well. I um, decided I'd do some activity which was around thinking about how you work with disabled athletes. And um, if you've watched them running, the blind runners run with somebody alongside them. So I did that, but I did it in a sports hall. The person running alongside fell over, didn't let the person blindfold know they'd fallen over, and the blindfold person had put their trust in this person entirely and became concussed when she hit the wall at the far end of the sports <laughs> hall. And I ended up in A&E. Again, couldn't happen today. Health and safety would not allow it to happen. But I guess these are things that I tried out and learnt hard messages. Assessment. Assessment to me is not about a hurdle and providing that barrier for students before they move on. It's about learning. It's about feedback to the student on how they're progressing. It's about feedback to the tutor on how much you're managing to convey the messages that you want to get across. So how much are the students engaging with the learning? And I put the um, conference poster up because this was many, many years ago when I first suggested using a conference poster. Um, and I was at my module approval event. I'm very, very new in, and they just said, you can't do that. That's not academic. And it was really challenged. Now we wouldn't think twice about it. But there was, and I've heard another example here where somebody told me they were going to use a website, build constructing a website, great, practical skill, employers will want it. But they were challenged, where's the academic part of the website? We'd better write a little academic piece to go with it to make sure it's an academic assessment. We need to think about where assessments fit and what feedback they give to students and to us and how it constitutes part of their learning. Um, the reason I put a graph there is in teaching physiology, I used subtasks, which we had a long debate about the other day. Every week, the students did um, a lab practical session and wrote reports. Did I mark all the reports? No, I didn't. But every third or fourth week, the students would bring them in, they'd work together, I'd work with them, we'd think about how we interpret the data, how it's best to display the data. At the end of the term, I would put a list up of which of those reports each student was going to submit. If they missed a week, they were in trouble if that was the one that went up and they needed to submit. Ways of making students come to class and engage with learning. This was another stage. In 1995, at Teesside University, I became part of the group that put together the University Learning and Teaching Strategy, and I think it was one of the first, if not the first, in the country. And I went to a conference to present it in 1996. Today, it wouldn't work as a strategy. We're much further on. But actually, if you think in terms of what it's saying, if you look to the top end, it's talking about what's, what's the student journey about. They enter at a foundation level. You want to get them to where they've consolidated their learning and they've developed some expertise. And we work through what does that mean. So what kind of learning and teaching approaches do we need to use in year one and in year two and in year three to get them toward working towards becoming independent learners? And we always went backwards. What do we want them to know? What do we want them to be able to do? And what will we have to do through the phases of their learning to get them there? So although this, as I say, goes a long, long way back, to me, I actually went, I went back to Teesside and said, have you still got it? Because I hadn't got a copy. 
but it's always stayed in my mind about how do you progress students through their learning and when we're designing curricula are we going through that thought process about those transitions from year one to year two to year three so I found that a really useful tool so now I just want to say a little bit about curriculum design I am um, I've been involved in design, developing a lot of courses and one of the things that is clear is you don't need to be a subject expert to lead on curriculum design so the first course I led on which did fit with my discipline was sports science this was in the early 90s and you will be aware there are sports science courses in all the different universities in the country and there's something about coming late into the market about how do you make this a niche course what can we do that's different and firstly I there was only me to begin with and two psychologists who had been PE teachers in the past so had some understanding of sports science and we linked in with psychology and gave this course a really strong research methods base it became very research focused but the other thing we did was introduce something called personal development in relation to sport. It was PDP. And it was 20% of our program. So every year, students had to apply their learning from the theoretical modules to their own particular performance and growth. In year one, they set objectives for the short term and the long term. One of those students is now in the, um, well, she's a world record holder for running from Land's End to John O'Groats and she's also in the top five for running for 24 hours and a really silly sport as far as I'm concerned but um, I read her book and she referred to PDRS because she remembered setting her goals and her long-term goal was to be a world record holder and at the time she probably thought it was not reachable and achievable but she got there so that was quite powerful in its day and in fact, I got a letter from Loughborough when our first cohort, five of the students went to Loughborough to do a master's. And they wrote and said, your students were the best prepared we've ever had in terms of their research methods, which was great. What we aimed to do was achieved. This was another course I was involved in developing. What do I know about policing? Nothing. But I was a dean by then of social sciences and law, and law enforcement was a big part of what we did. And we got major contracts with some of the police forces to do their initial police training. What was important is that we didn't go with one model and say, this is what police training looks like, because we were working with West Mercia, who cover areas like Hereford and Worcester, and we were working with Teesside, who are in a totally different sort of economy and totally different sort of location. So they needed different types of policing programmes but fundamentally, all of them were based around national occupational standards. We based it around a portfolio, work-based learning, problem-based learning. So we had a model for the design of the programme, but we could fit it to lots of different sort of locations. Early years. This was an interesting one because we had lots and lots of partner colleges delivering early years programmes to um, diploma level and we had lots of students wanting top-up degrees but we also, one of our first students on our top-up programme was an Ofsted inspector and Ofsted contacted us and said we'd like you to offer this to all of our Ofsted inspectors from across the country so we needed to provide distance learning technology was quite new at this time but we set this course up with two um, intensive weeks study and the rest was done online. It was done with podcasts, which in those days were just simple talking heads, discussion groups, and again, they weren't sophisticated, and devising learning communities. So again, we're thinking about how do we design our model, how do we design our curriculum to suit these particular students and their needs. I saw an email come in from a student that said, I don't even have my breakfast now when I know a podcast is due in, I'm so excited, can't wait to see what's coming next. And so that's great if you grasp students in that way, through the way you're approaching their learning. We can do things so much better now, but in those days, that was about as far as we could go. My final one, surgeons. We didn't have a medical school. I was working with anaesthetists, burns and plastics, orthopods, and I um, can't remember who the fourth group were. And they wanted a programme for their house doctors. 
House doctors who are waiting to become consultants, very specialist area, and what could we offer? What we did was devise a programme which was all around research, because actually, for medics, it's important to them, like it is to academics, to engage in their discipline, to contribute to research, and to publish. And so the whole programme was built around researching, producing conference papers, publishing, and that was actually required of their final dissertation, it had to be sent for publication. So we built the programme around this. Where did they get the specialist input? From the practitioners back in the hospital. We worked together to deliver the programme. Highly successful, and other groups joined it as time went on. So, part of my journey, I've mentioned technology. I started with those chalkboards when I was teaching my maths, that big roller board going around. And I'm a bit sad that children today can't be blackboard monitor because I loved being blackboard monitor. And that's when I first found out I was bossy, I think, when I was looking after the blackboard. Um, the other thing that isn't on there is the bander machines where you get blue ink. A few of you are nodding, a lot of you are thinking, I don't know what she's talking about. Um, but we've progressed. And actually, I looked at that old computer. Thank you, Sarah at the front. Sarah Smith drew these for me. Amazing. And I've now got a whole set of slides like this. And this is about as modern as I get and not done by me. The computer I remember when I studied computing as part of my master's degree was um, a big, uh, we had six mainframes in the university, that was all. And all the hardware was in a room next to us and it went from floor to ceiling. It was massive. And print jobs had to be done overnight. So quite, quite different. Simon, thank you this morning. Death by PowerPoint, I'm doing it myself now, but it isn't what I advocate. But we still have many people doing it. And it's something about thinking about what are we trying to do when we're using PowerPoint. If nothing else, what I usually like to do, and those of you who've seen me speak before will know, I like to break it up with videos and things like that. And now we're moving to mobile devices and how our mobile, device, mobile devices, as Simon was doing this morning, interact with our main presentations. Well, how I got involved in technology, by the way, I've tried to develop it looking at early years and how we use it in the classroom. I led for Teesside on developing the e-learning strategy. We don't have them anymore in universities because it's just part and parcel of what we do. But in the beginning, it was very separate. I'm sure it was probably the same at Hallam as well, that you had to think separately about e-learning. But it was very much something that, that really drew me in and I was interested in the technologies today. I absolutely love what you're doing, but goodness, I'm lost and I can't use them much. Um, my next thing was learning spaces. This was when I was at Derby and the top room up there has a main screen which you could control with your tablet or your phone and it has four other screens that are connected. If you also look at the furniture, it can be configured in whatever way you want it. Because at this time, my take on it was that the, the four walls that surrounded you and the furniture in the room you were in often impacted on how you taught. So if you walk into a room and there's a lectern at the front and there's a whiteboard at the front, you automatically talk at the group. So I wanted a room, and we've had the conversation here, I think Charles Street won't have any lecterns, for those of you that didn't know because it's about how can you teach differently. So it was about how can we develop this space to be used differently and how can the students engage with the technology rather than just the tutor using the technology to talk at the students. And so by introducing that, the students were engaging in their groups with the tutor who could also work to the master screen and pull all the different screens in as we were working. The room was only 60% used when it was first opened. Now you can't get in it. The bottom picture is the informal space, and to me, that again, you'll have heard me talking about it, formal and informal spaces should be blurring now, and I saw some of you in the atrium beginning to drift through to the new open learning space off the atrium. And we should see students blending between those formal spaces, informal spaces, walking out of your classrooms, carrying on with the conversations they were having, accessing the technologies, accessing the information. And in that setup, you'll see big screens on the wall, touch screens. 
It's about being visible, sharing what we're doing. The pods are all mobile, so it could all be moved around, and that space is really, really well used. And we're doing lots at Sheffield Hallam to really change our learning spaces. And this has been um, a big part of what I've tried to drive here because it, it really does grab me, and we've got a future learning spaces group, and it's brilliant to see where we're going now with our spaces. I went to Samsung a couple of weeks ago. For those of you on Twitter who have followed me, you might have seen a picture of um, Graham with a headset on, with doing some more looking at augmented reality. But those screens, they actually were working on two screens, and one of them swiped one screen, and what they had on the one screen then appeared on the next screen, and they had somebody out of the room sending information through from other files, and there were lots of files being drawn onto one screen and flipped across screens. It was amazing. It's coming. We're trying to persuade Samsung to put some of that in here so we can get to be the first to use this sort of new and emerging technology. Virtual space is so much more a part of what we do now. And, of course, we've got the one-to-ones and the one-to-groups we know where we're communicating within those learning communities that we've developed and built. But as Simon referred to this morning, Twitter and our social media getting out to the world out there and talking to people that you've never met and don't know, but begin to develop a lot in common with them. And I have to say a big thank you to Andrew Middleton, Sue Beckingham, um, David Smith, David Eddy, because I do follow all your tweets. I'm astounded by what you're bringing to us in terms of learning, and uh, I'd love to be in the classroom now and able to use it. So what's all of this done for our students? I think by all of these new and emerging approaches and by thinking about how we're delivering our teaching, we are seeing students far more engaged than we've seen them and far more interactive with each other. We're not at the centre anymore. We're facilitators of learning, but we're not the centre of it. We're not critical in many, in many aspects. The students themselves can manage that. The learning spaces I've mentioned, this blurring of boundaries, and it's really important that when you're using your contact time, you're thinking about how you're going to engage the students as they walk out of those four walls. If you're teaching a module and they never pick up a book or do anything until the next session, somehow we've let the students down because there's something that we should be doing that inspires them to carry on learning as they leave. So we've got students co-producing, We've got them designing, we talk about them curating, and when I look at the MOOC that we delivered, I just couldn't believe the wealth of materials that came in that can be used with other students and that are being shared worldwide in terms of um, prostate cancer care. So the opportunities for sharing and developing our knowledge base and understanding are just endless now, and the access to resources is incredible. So Sarah, thank you. Those are all of the different sketches she put together to me when I gave just a very brief idea of the sorts of things I wanted to talk about. So what was I trying to get to in terms of my principles? Regardless of the technologies, the technologies should not drive what we do. The technologies are there as a tool to support us in engaging our students and ensuring that they are really learning in whichever um, place they are. We've got to be thinking about the learning, teaching and assessment strategy and where we are in the student journey. How does that fit with the rest of their programme and how does that fit in terms of their level of study? And the assessment, make it meaningful, not just a piece of academic work for the sake of it. What good will that do them as they move forward? I always talk about the piece of academic work I remember best was when I was studying at Sheffield. And I was asked to write a 500-word article on biochemistry for the sun. And it's the hardest piece of work I've ever done. And somebody would say, well, 500 words, is that worth 20 credits? We get too hung up on this sort of formulaic approach to assessment. Let's give it a little bit more thought about what we're trying to do with it. And what the technology is doing for us is the anytime, any place, anywhere. So I was asked to give you a question as you go off into your, are we calling them collabs? Yes. Collabs. 
As you go off into your collab, I want you to be thinking about what approaches you use to ensure that students are engaged beyond the classroom and that you can contextualise their learning experience. And I talked a little about that with my curriculum design. Do you want me to say what they've got to do as a group and what they're going to do, the big challenge? Yes, At the end of this, you are going to bring back one word. That's all. Each group will bring back one word that is meaningful to you and says something about this challenge. And then hopefully, collectively, we can begin to identify what the priorities are for us at Sheffield Hallam. What would you like to see in place? What do I need to do in terms of any influence I can have on our strategic direction? So go enjoy, and I can't wait to see what you bring back. Thank you.